Good morning, afternoon, HTB. It's good afternoon. How are you doing? Yeah. Shall we start again? Good afternoon, HTB. Yeah. Great. Isn't it good? God doing amazing things in our midst as we worship. Um, and he's going to do more today. I believe he's going to bring breakthrough. So let's just pray for a moment, shall we? God, we ask that we continue to know your presence. Lord, we thank you you're here. Thank you for the thickness of your presence, Holy Spirit. God, we don't want to look at your word as a practical exercise. We want to look at it as worship. And we invite you to transform us and make us more like you today. So come in Jesus' name. I don't know how many of you have ever done a hackathon. Uh, there's a few people nodding, a couple of people thinking, what is he talking about? The sermon started two seconds ago and I'm already lost. Um, but those of you who are nodding and thinking, yeah, yeah, I know a hackathon, I know a hackathon, it's likely that you're, you're a coder, you build apps, or you're into graphic design or something like that. Because a hackathon is where all these kind of clever people who understand technology, I'm not one of them, in case you think I am, I'm still at the level of, I'll switch the computer off at the wall if it goes wrong. Leave it 10 seconds, switch it back on, and usually it works. So I'm still happy with that. That's okay. That's the way I do it. But these clever technical people will get together and do a hackathon. 24 hours, 48 hours, sometimes longer. Bring a sleeping bag, bring the food. They'll get in a room, and they'll crunch a particular issue. They'll, they'll work out an idea, and they'll build it there and then. They'll do all the graphics. They'll put all the coding together. They'll, ha they'll launch an app. They'll do something. Some of these hackathons have produced multi-million pound companies already. Uh, some of them just happened, and then they're gone, and everyone enjoyed the creative process and went home to get some sleep. And, and that's what happens. That's a hackathon. Well, Matthew chapter 5 is like Jesus' hackathon with his followers. He gathers his disciples, those that are following him, the crowds, and he pulls out his Sermon on the Mount, which is like, come on guys, let's crunch all these issues. Let's, let's get our heads together and work out something so that we can get a better solution. And ultimately, Matthew 5 is an exploration around a whole load of themes that Jesus wanted to deal with in order that people would live the fullest life they could. Live the life that he wanted them to live. And so it's good news to grapple with Matthew chapter 5 as he deals with murder and adultery, uh, divorce, some of these big themes that we face in society now. But they're challenging. And this hackathon, this life hacks series we're in, isn't, isn't just simple and easy. It's not like, oh, that's good. Jesus said it, let's go. It's a challenge to us. And today's passage is no different. We're going to be engaging with issues around resentment and forgiveness as we work out what it means to love our enemies. Now, you might think you haven't got any enemies, but let's find out. Let's go to the scriptures right here. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. And I'm going to read it to us. It'll come up on the screen, or you can grab it on the device. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He comes, he, ca he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you are great... If you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Well, there's a challenge to start with, but let's go back to the beginning of this passage because Jesus is throwing out this whole issue around neighbors and enemies. And that sense of, oh, you might have heard it said, love your neighbor. So in Jesus' day, everyone was talking about that. In fact, it's a law that was commanded in Leviticus chapter 19. So it was deep ingrained in the people for hundreds of years, this sense of we need to love our neighbor. But people were grappling with, what does it mean to love my neighbor? What does that look like? And the reason they were asking that question is so that they could work out who's not my neighbor. And if they're not my neighbor, maybe I can hate them. And that fits because there's loads of people that I really hate. Because everybody struggles with somebody. So if I can put them in the not neighbor category, it's okay if I don't like them. And so that's the question that was bubbling up in people. In fact, you know, one person came to Jesus and asked that question. Jesus, who's my neighbor? You might remember it. And Jesus tells a story, as he often does in response. He tells the story of the Good Samaritan. 
and basically paints this picture of a Samaritan who is like the neighbor, who looks after an injured person when some of the religious leaders had walked past and not looked after them. And of course, his crowd was shocked at this story because the Samaritans were enemies. They were not like the Israelites. They didn't keep the laws of God. They weren't perfect. And so they were seen as enemies. And so Jesus is saying, hey, hey, your enemies, they're your neighbors. And so he deals with it head on right here in chapter five. You may have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I'm saying to you today, love your enemies. So basically, Jesus is saying, you need to learn what it's like to love everyone. That's challenging. In fact, it seems to be almost impossible, doesn't it? When I got ordained, one of my friends gave me this as an ordination present. You might expect a, a new Bible or a commentary to help with the sermon, but he gave me a flying pig. <laughs> and he said, put this pig in your study, Pete, because there are gonna be days when you need to look at this pig. Because people say pigs can't fly. And people say that some things are impossible, but with God, all things are possible. When you feel like there's no way through, when you feel like you're hitting a wall, when you're, you feel like Jesus is challenging you for more, when you feel like actually people you're working with, are, you're struggling with, or they're challenging, or the situation is difficult, when you're praying for healing and you're not seeing it break through, when you're seeing, you're longing for that miracle to happen or that job to come through and it doesn't happen, look at this statue and remember, God is the God of the impossible. He's able to break through even when you can't. That's good news, isn't it? So I wanted to bring this pig today and I'm gonna leave it right here so it kind of catches in the back of the camera shot from time to time. And that's a reminder for anyone sitting here this morning. If you're sitting there right now in panic thinking, why did I come to church today? I can't face forgiving my enemies. This relationship's too hard. That situation and circumstance, I resent it. I find this hard, I find that difficult, this is too complex, and now you're telling me to forgive my enemies? Well, just keep looking at the pig. Because with God, all things are possible, and he wants to bring breakthrough to you today. That's why you're here. So listen in and lean in. Some of you are thinking, well, I don't have any enemies, right? I, I, I can't remember the last time I said, you are my enemy. And the reality is we don't say that in our culture, do we? We don't kind of walk around going, you, enemy, you, enemy, you, enemy. We don't really talk like that. Perhaps in Jesus' day, there was a little bit more chat like that because there was a sense of being uh, occupied by an enemy army, the Romans, and they were very close to and a sense of these are our enemies. They're holding us back or they're, they're occupying us and they didn't like it. But there are plenty of places where we can create enemies today. And in a time in our country at the moment where Brexit is, is, is kind of forging forwards or not going anywhere or whatever it is, there's a sense in which there's struggle. But there will be in your lives as well. And whilst we wouldn't name somebody an enemy, I would like to suggest this morning that most of us, if not all of us, have low-grade enemies. What does enemy mean? It's a Greek word right there that Jesus uses for enemy, ekrom. And it means someone who's hostile or causes harm or even moves to hatred. So anyone who's caused you harm or is hostile to you, that's a low-grade enemy. Now I know I've got issues in this area because I don't find every relationship easy. And sometimes I meet people and they may say something or do something or they may just be something. Maybe they don't do anything to me personally, but for some reason, I, re I, I retreat from them. And then when I retreat from them, I'm more likely to slide towards resenting them, either because of their success or because they said something that was not nice or because they represent something that I don't like. And so I end up resenting that person because they're holding up a philosophy or a belief or an idea that I don't like. Maybe they've even attacked me and been hostile towards me, but at some level, I'm holding resentment towards them. The minute you're moving into a space of resentment, you're creating enemies, even if you don't use that word. You're holding people away at arm's length. And as I say, that's an issue that I struggle with. And maybe some of us can relate to that too. 
all kinds of people in the past, work colleagues, church leaders, friends, family, in-laws. A few nudges going on in the congregation. I saw you. You've got to come for prayer ministry at the end, all right? <laughs> I'm joking, joking, joking. So what do we do with it? What do we do? Do we just like hold out and just say, well, look, low-level enemy, it's not a problem. Why don't I just embrace resentment? Resent A little bit of resentment, it'll give me a little bit of a fire in my belly. That's okay. We'll hold on to resentment. Are we going to settle for that or are we going to listen to Jesus today as he teaches us from this Sermon on the Mount, this life hack to solve something for us? And if we're going to listen to him and love our enemies, then how can we practically step towards loving our enemies? Well, here's the beginning. Anyone who knows anything about love, any kind of love, knows that one of its closest allies is forgiveness. You can't really engage in love for very long without having to face into forgiveness, to saying sorry. And forging forgiveness is the only pathway to loving our enemies. And I choose that word forging for a good reason. Uh, if you've ever been to see a farrier or a blacksmith working on some metal and in a forge, and they're forging away to try and change the shape, and it takes hitting and hammering, and it takes hard work, it causes sweat. And I think sometimes that is what happens in forgiveness. To truly forgive is not always easy. It sometimes requires us to work at it. It sometimes requires us to forge it. But forging forgiveness will be the only way to step towards the open door of loving our enemies. It's where it has to start. And we have to begin to choose forgiveness over resentment. You see, resentment creates distance, but forgiveness develops closeness. Resentment creates division, but forgiveness brings union. Resentment develops control, but forgiveness brings us to freedom. Resentment creates anger in us, but forgiveness develops peace. Resentment leads to brokenness, but forgiveness leads to wholeness. And Jesus wants you to be close, united, free, peaceful, and whole. Psychologists have caught up with that. You know, Jesus said it, pursued it, and even said radical things like love your neighbor because he knew it was going to lead to that kind of life. Psychologists in recent years have done research and stacked up all their evidence and looked at different things and shock horror, they found that more forgiving people are, they're going to have less anxiety, less anger in their lives. They create more social networks which develops greater support networks in their lives. They found that more forgiving people are categorically more healthy, physically and in emotionally, emotionally in their mind. They've even found and stated that forgiving people have a greater and better spiritual well-being. So they've caught up with all the research of what Jesus was already saying as a reason why we would go after forgiveness over resentment. Because he knew it was best for us and best for the world that we shouldn't hold on to resentment, that we should pursue forgiveness. I know that may seem difficult if the idea of forgiving somebody who has hurt you or is openly hostile to you seems impossible. But if that's you right now, keep looking at the pig. God can do something even today. He can create the impossible. And the reality is this, God will allow enemies in our lives. We read it right there in the passage. He, he causes the sun to shine on the righteous and the unrighteous. The rain falls on those that are evil and good. You see, we're in a mix of this world and there are gonna be all kinds of clashes and tensions. And so God will allow us to engage with people who would be hostile or would seek to harm. And one of the reasons, I think, apart from to shine the goodness of his kingdom into their lives, is to test us and help us to grow in this area. So here's three quick things for us to practically grow in the area of forgiveness over resentment. Here's number one. Connect to your choice. Connect to your choice. See, one of the biggest gifts of God is that he's given you a choice. As a loving God, he gives you a free will and it means you have a choice to make. You can make choices. That means you can experience love. It means you can step on and experience him. 
And every change, every significant change in our behavior, our thinking, even in our walk with Jesus begins with a choice. Yes, I want that. Yes, I'm moving towards that. Don't underestimate the simplicity and the power of your choice. Connect to your choice. I loved what uh, Nikki posted on Instagram this week. If you follow Nikki, Nikki Gumbel, our vicar, on Instagram, uh, you'll likely to get lots of morning scenes of Hyde Park. They're really good. I was actually in Hyde Park earlier than Nikki the other day, and I nearly took a photo, but then I thought, oh no, it's just me being competitive and trying to <laughs> post an earlier sunrise than Nikki Gumbel. So I thought, I won't post that. But he also posts all sorts of inspirational quotes, and several have gone up this week. And one of them this week said this, if you want to know what love's like, what, how does love work? Well, it's 10% emotion, 20% understanding the other, and 70% the will. That's your decision, your choice to love. If you're gonna love your enemies, make the choice. I'm gonna choose to love. And sometimes our emotions catch up with that choice. But begin with that, connect with your choice. I love what it says in verse 44 of our passage. It goes on, it says, love your enemies and pray for them who persecute you. See, Jesus is giving the practical tools in the process of this. He's saying, you know, don't, it's not just like out there somewhere, but actually start actively wanting the spiritual best even for those that persecute you. Now, I don't know about your prayer life and how healthy you think it is right now. Maybe you're praying every day, every minute, who knows? Maybe it's kind of occasional and sometimes hard, isn't it, to keep up with a prayer life. You're spinning all these plates and, you know, if you do actually get to praying anytime, you start praying about urgent issues, like, you know, got to get past the exam or sort this issue out, or, or, then, or then you might start praying about your loved ones, your family, your friends, people that need help, somebody who needs healing that you care for. And you present all those prayers, they're all good prayers, but how many of us then progress on to, and here's my prayer list for my enemies. And yes, that, well, that's what Jesus invites us to do to make a choice to step towards them, to pray. It may begin there for some of you today, even if you feel it's impossible to get to full forgiveness. If you make that choice and step towards it and begin to pray, even for those that have persecuted you, you'll move that way. Secondly, connect with Christ's forgiveness. So connect with your choice and connect with Christ's forgiveness. See, Jesus talked about forgiveness all the time. And it's for a very good reason, because he came into the world to forgive us. He was going to be the ultimate model of what true forgiveness looks like. And so, so often you get these stories and circumstances that happen that speak of Jesus' forgiveness. There was one occasion that I'm gonna paraphrase. You can find it in Luke 7 later if you want to. But the paraphrase is this. There's a guy called Simon who's a Pharisee, a religious leader of the day, and uh, he says, si- uh, Jesus, come around to my place. We're gonna have some food. And so Jesus goes around to get some food with Simon. They're sitting down together. The Pharisee Simon is kind of sussing Jesus out. Who is this guy? Seems extraordinary, not quite sure. He says some things, I don't know. And as they're talking, in breaks this woman. And Simon immediately sees the woman and knows she is sinful. This woman is like, don't go near this woman. She lets everyone down. She's not right. She's not good. And actually, you know, if Jesus really is the son of God, he would know that this woman is a total mess and shouldn't be anywhere near him. Simon immediately makes this woman an enemy. He resents her. He retreats from her. Now, Jesus is a mind reader. He knows exactly what Simon's thinking. And he says, Simon, I want to tell you a story. Let me paraphrase this. Imagine Fernando here. Just stand up, Fernando. Here he is. Imagine Fernando owes me a million pounds. It's not far off, is it? Yeah. And Ryan here. Can you stand up, Ryan? He owes me 500 pounds. And one day I turn up to, to church and I'm sort of feeling particularly passionate, compassionate. And I sort of stand here and I look at these two guys and I go, hey guys, you know what, I'm having a good day. Um, you know, don't worry about the 500 quid. Write it off to go and have a party, it's fun. Great, you're all right, you're free. Hey, Flanda, don't worry about the million pounds. It's fine, you can just have it back. Don't worry, go for it, guys. Go and knock yourselves out. And then I let them off. Which of those guys is gonna go dancing around the aisle as they leave church today? Fernando. Off to Nando's to spend his million pounds. <clears throat> Thank you, guys. Well done. Give him a round of applause. 
So that, that is not exactly how Jesus told the story. It's not exactly how it was. But essentially, he looks at Simon and says, which one, which one? Which one's gonna love, love more? And Simon makes the same presumption. Oh, when you've been let off a lot, you know the value of that, you bring greater worth. And Jesus looks to the woman at his feet, who's broken in and now is breaking an alabaster jar of perfume over his feet. And he says to Simon, this woman understands that she's totally forgiven, that she's set free, that, that because of what I'm able to do, I can free her from that sin. And he says to her, woman, your faith has set you free. You are free of your sins. And Simon still sits there going like, who is this guy that can forgive sins? He's struggling with this forgiveness thing because he's got resentment against the enemy. See, listen, if you get connected to what Jesus has done for you, if you get connected to that and begin to really understand that whilst you are still far off, whilst what Romans says, Romans says you, we were enemies of God when Jesus came, but he stepped into the world and he stepped into the world because he wanted to demonstrate the love of God. And he lived his life in such a way that he says, I love you even though you are far off, even though you might be caught in things that are not perfect, that you're not quite perfect as a God yet, even though you've all made mistakes and something's gone wrong in all your lives, I'm here because I love you and I want to come towards you. And I'm gonna give even my life on a cross for the joy set before me, which is you, because I love you and I forgive you and I set you free to a new life. That's the call of Jesus. That's the good news of the gospel. And Jesus demonstrated it to all of us in order that as forgiven people, we might forgive. We need to get connected to the level of forgiveness we've received. And as we understand his forgiveness for us, it will make it easier for us to forgive even our enemies. He's gone ahead of us. And finally, connect with your enemy. You know, when you have an enemy or someone who's let you down, whether it's a high grade or low grade enemy, however you want to categorize them, you just want to retreat and then move towards resentment. And what that does is puts distance between you and them. I, I, I do this sometimes, I fall into this. Someone upsets me and I choose to stop talking to them. And I might not say, I'm not talking to you anymore. I just might start missing them, avoiding them, not being near them. And slowly in the back of my head, the thing they've done becomes bigger and bigger. And when it looks like they're ignoring me, I think they're an even bigger enemy. We have to step in towards those that everything in us wants to retreat from. And one of the ways you do that as a first step, if you feel that that's too much, is to empathize, to grow in the gift of empathy. You see, when we empathize with others, it grows compassion in us for other people's needs. It grows an understanding in us for something that's different in someone else that may have harmed us. And through that empathy, we begin to engage with the fact that they're just a broken person too. That they're just going about their day with their needs and their aspirations that somehow clashed with yours. And with that empathy, you can step towards your enemy. I really struggled with my dad when I was growing up. I grew real resentment towards him. Throughout all my childhood and early teens, he was working so hard, busting a gut in the city. He was working in business and, you know, he was smashing it and doing really well. But he was out of the house every morning at six and not back till nine, so I just never saw him. And he was traveling six months of the year. And so really I was brought up by my mum, me and my two brothers. We hardly ever saw my dad, but when he was around, he was so exhausted and burnt out that he would just be angry and cross with us. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever seen The Sound of Music, but uh, the Van Trop guy, Van, Van Trip, Trap, Trop, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> you know, it was a bit like that. Literally, on a, on a Saturday morning, if he was at home, it'd be like, right, boys, fall in, show me your fingernails. And if they weren't clean, we were in trouble. That was my experience. And I grew in a sense of distance as I began to emotionally understand what was going on. And I remember a day when I was 14, and my dad announced to us all, I'm leaving business and I'm gonna become a vicar. I was like, you are not vicar material. <laughs> I don't 
don't care how good St. Melitus is, it's not helping you. I'm serious, I'm serious. It's like, this, you're, not the, you're not material for a vicar, I know you. You've upset me, you've harmed me, you've let me down. I feel like you've not been there at times, quite often. And now you wanna be a vicar? I struggled with that. When I got to about the age of 19, I went on a conference. And I, at this conference, it was de- talking about God's heart towards us as a father. And someone in one of the talks started provoking us about our own experience of fathers and how that might uh, impact our experience of God and all of that stuff. And I'd never really heard any of that before that time. And I came face to face with the reality that I was really full of resentment towards my dad and that some of that was spilling into my understanding of who God was. And I began to pray and I remember weeping as I prayed saying, God, you've got to help me. I don't really understand this. I don't know what to do about it. I wasn't really ready to let go of any of the resentment because I was justified in being upset with him. Some of you here right now, you feel justified in being upset with the people that you've been thinking about through this talk. And I felt God in his grace, by his spirit, begin just to talk to me about my dad. And I remembered that my Father's father had died when my dad was 16 because of alcohol abuse. He had drunk any money the family had, spent the lot and died leaving the family with nothing. So my dad at 16 had to go out and become the breadwinner for his mum and four other siblings. He went out, started at the bottom of the chain with no qualifications and had to work and bust his gut to build something. And bit by bit, he built something. And he'd got into this cycle of, in his own thinking, I've just got to provide for my family. I'm going to provide in a way that my dad didn't provide for me. And so he was out busting a gut, working so hard whilst we were growing up because that was his expression of love to us. I never understood that. I'm not sure if he understood that. But I tell you what, as I began to get compassion and empathy with his situation, I began to realize this was a much bigger picture going on. The compassion in my heart began to grow. A lot of compassion had grown in his heart because he had gone to theological college and now he was a vicar. He was a good vicar. And our relationship became much, much better to the point where just a few years ago when he died, it was a beautiful moment. And his last words were of pride towards me. God did something. God can do something for you too. Because our ultimate goal in this passage, as we've read at the beginning, is to become perfect, therefore, as our heavenly Father is perfect. You know, we can run after vision and great things. We can have global impact. We can, we can use all our gifts and our skills and serve on teams and be involved in a great church right here in the center of London, see the whole thing change and, and be passionate about it and excited about all that we're running after. But if we can't love our neighbor and our enemy, we'll never be like our heavenly father. And if you want to know what he's like and what he wants us to become like, even towards our enemy, Well, he's like this. He's patient. He's kind. He doesn't envy. He does not boast. He's not proud. He's not rude. He's not self-seeking. He's not easily angered. He keeps no record of wrongs. He does not delight in evil, but replaces it with truth. He always protects. He always trusts. He always hopes. He always perseveres. Connect with your choice connect with Christ's forgiveness and connect with your enemy. And maybe, just maybe, with the help of the Spirit of God towards what for some of us will feel impossible, we might just become the most loving people on the planet, reflecting our perfect heavenly Father. Amen.